You're welcome to the Michael Harding podcast. Thank you for being here. This is just me and you. It's me sharing a story, a reflection. When I was a boy, I had a pet kitten who lived in the scullery. I sat beside her with a saucer of milk, and my mother said to keep the scullery door closed. So I left it open, and the kitten ran into the kitchen and under the table. I ran after her, and she jumped onto a chair. I dived at the chair to grab her, but she jumped onto the worktop beside the electric cooker. I saw that the cooker ring was red hot, and then the kitten jumped straight onto it. Maybe then, back then, I might have needed a therapist, because I was traumatised, although not half as much as the kitten, with big red blisters on her paws. Ironically, she ran straight back into the scullery, where she sheltered behind a few biscuit tins in the corner and didn't come out for days. I've often used this story as a metaphor for healing. They say a cat has nine lives. And so a week behind the biscuit tins in the scullery did wonders for her physical health. It's as if the time itself was a balm for the wound. But I'm sure the cat was also terrified. So I left saucers of water for her, although she didn't urinate or defecate. Sometimes her eyes looked out from the dark in a kind of stunned fright. Yet, mysteriously, when she eventually emerged into my arms, she purred and was completely relaxed. As if, by just being alone, she had experienced a balm for her psychological wounds. So says I to me therapist many years later, I think I'm like the cat because I like to be alone when I want to heal. It even crossed my mind that this is the reason I became a writer. Instead of commuting to work, I go into my own little refuge in the studio every morning like the cat behind the biscuit tins. I stare at a screen dreaming stories and harvesting memories. And if there are traumas that arise in my life, I deal with them there in that seclusion. Not that I don't value psychotherapists. I wouldn't have survived thus far without occasional sessions and seasons on the therapist's couch. My best friend is a therapist, and indeed it was he who often reminded me that depression can be an opportunity for new discoveries. As Rumi says, the wound is where the light comes in. But the therapists can only bring me so far. They can only do so much. There is a threshold in my own heart beyond which I must travel alone. When I told my therapist ten years ago about the cat, she stared at me with compassion. It was one of those pauses when I felt that even she, with all her skill, could not unravel the contradictions of my unruly psyche. She helped me for a number of years while I was sorting out the past and tracing various disturbing emotions back to childhood events. But I knew I needed to find a much deeper core of mindfulness than what the therapist had maps for. I was convinced that a part of me, like the cat, 
found healing in solitary places. That in solitude I found a threshold deep down, where I experienced a sense of being in dialogue with some transcendent other, to use Martin Buber's phrase. Not a rational linguistic dialogue, but rather an embrace of the heart, a sense of being loved even at the core of my own loneliness, and a sense of a wider cosmic self holding me in harmony. And I'll go as far as Francis of Assisi might by suggesting that perhaps the cat in the scullery was experiencing the same love when she hid behind the biscuit tins in her long-ago agony. I'm not sure if I'm being Christian, Sufi or Buddhist when I say this. More likely, I'm just a demented writer, but it's undoubtedly the key to my life, the core of my new book, the heart of this podcast and the single fact that makes me happy as I grow older. Certainly, there is more to my affection for cats than I sometimes admit. And since both my children happen to work with horses, I know that there is more to all those lovely animals than what the world cares to admit. We are all the one thing. Our eyes are windows to the soul, and there's a threshold within that we must cross if we ever want to find peace. What I like to do in the podcast is to share this sense of faith. And I share it in the podcast, I suppose, in a way that's more personal than anywhere else. I mean, I write books, I write a column in the newspaper, and I tour the country as I'm doing now, starting next Saturday. But here is different. Here it feels like, A, first of all, it's like there's me and you. But in another way, I feel there's a third presence. And, and this is the present that Martin Buber talks about as the other, the sacred other. And it's the, the otherness, I feel, that is in all the books and wisdom of Christian orthodoxy about, about theosis, about that sense of being absorbed in God, that, that in some sense when you're alone, you're not alone. That's the best way I can put it. And I said that actually... Last Saturday night on the stage in the Theatre Royal in Waterford, I was sharing the stage with Blind Boy. Blind Boy is just a master storyteller. He's a wonderful, gifted young writer, artist. He does a podcast which is magnificent. He's very, very, I'm, he's just so, so talented. He's like, to some extent, he reminds me of Flann O'Brien, you know, Miles Nagopolin, the surrealism of those books like At Swim Two Boards and The Third Policeman. But in another way, he reminds me of Borges, Louis Borges, the, the South American writer, because he has a kind of simplicity in the kind of narrative. You know, he goes for a one single big image and one thing happening at a time. And he read a story actually on stage and it was about a donkey and the donkey was damaged like abused and beaten and and badly injured by some cruel person and the donkey was wandering around a motorway now this is a fiction but it, it's it still reflects where he's coming from so the driver of a car is coming along and he sees the donkey, and he wants to help the donkey. He wants to mind the donkey. So what does he do? He's driving a small Fiat, little small baby car. So he stops, and he tries to get the donkey into the car, and he's successful. 
and you have to remember this is a surreal story it's a fiction and yet and yet those kind of fictions they contain a powerful truth so he describes how how he was trying to push the donkey's hind legs bend them so that the donkey would put its arse into the car and he finally got the donkey into the car and it's like he, the donkey is sitting in the back seat but its front feet are in the front seat and its big head is looking out the windscreen and you can imagine this fellow driving the little car and a huge big head of a donkey beside him and a donkey's head is very big it's a very big thing and then he'd be looking at him and your man would be looking at the donkey and, and all the the damage, you know, the violence, the blood, because somebody had battered this donkey. And it is such a powerful image. And it, it's like Kafka. It's like Borges. It, it reminds me also because Blind Boy was telling me that the reason that he got the story from something Nietzsche said. Nietzsche was very moved one day, the great philosopher. He was very moved one day by the cruelty of a human, a man, to a horse. And he made a big observation about that. And there was a filmmaker in Hungary called Bella Tarr, And he made a film called The Horse of Turin, which again is, is about... He, he had read the Nietzsche comment about the cruelty to a horse, and he, he wrote a beautiful movie about it. And then Blind Boy comes along, and he, he writes this magnificent story about a donkey that's abused and trying to help him by getting him into the back of the small car. In, I, I was saying to him, actually, that to me the donkey becomes like the Christ, you know, the, the suffering wounded one. Even though it's a donkey, it's a surreal image, and yet it carries the sense of somebody who is so bruised and so abused. And that kind of writing is masterful, and I think that Blind Boy is... It's almost like Blind Boy, I sometimes think, you know, he's not even aware, fully, not even fully conscious of how good he is and how good he will become. I think he's a young man. And I think he will become very, very powerful as a writer as he goes on. And there's a wonderful thing he does as well. You know, he talks about his mental health. I suppose that's where there's a connection between us. So he talks very personally about his own life on his podcast, as well as telling very funny stories. And I find a connection with that, and I was... I was thrilled and privileged when he invited me to be part of his podcast for an evening. It meant like two hours sharing the stage in the Theatre Royal with this wonderfully gifted young man. And I felt it really a bit of a privilege. And I loved it. And we had great fun with the audience. And I would have been sharing with the audience what's in that reflection that I just read. The sense that there is a threshold inside me that that is it's a, it's a place i go which it brings me beyond psychotherapy psychotherapy i have used and it has been very positive but there's a spot beyond and that's the place of prayer and i suppose when i started talking like this I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I didn't have any plan with the podcast. But more and more over the past six months or 12 months, I, I feel that, you know, Ireland is going into a space of enormous stress and self-criticism. It, it would be easy to despair when you listen to the amount of things that seem to be wrong with the country and wrong with the world, and wrong with Europe. And to be honest, it's in that context that I reach more and more for prayer. I reach for prayer, I reach for that sense of a threshold within that allows me to feel that there is a great presence around me. And it's like the darker it gets on the outside, it could be the, you know, the Ukraine 
the invasion of Ukraine and the war and like whatever it be, there's poverty, there's there's all sorts of ways society is seems to be breaking down, and it could wear you out. And what I find is, and I don't find it anything to be ashamed of in my own life. I have deeply, deeply, deeply tried to use Christian faith, meditation, contemplation, just as a way to keep calm, just as a way to help the mental health. And also to feel that I'm not alone. I mean, I mean that is a huge buzz I get from religion. You know that? It's a huge buzz. That, that if I'm in this room and I have an icon and I have a sense of, you know, the presence of the mother of God or of, you know, angel or saint or or even just communion of saints, like, you know, people I loved who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith, as they say, and, and I'm feeling that they are present with me. It's like a great consolation. It makes me feel okay. And I'm happy with the, even if it was only the placebo effect of prayer. There's been loads of studies into the fact that prayer in any religion, helps you through life. That, that you know, you, you tend to be happy or you tend to to heal. There's so many ways that prayer helps. And you can acknowledge that even if it's a placebo effect. But even as a placebo effect, you'd still use it. It's, it's, it's like, it's like even if everything behind the language of religion was gobbledygook nonsense, you'd actually still use it because it's, it, it works. It makes you feel better and healthier and able to relate more lovingly to other people. So I'm, I'm really in favour and for the old religion. I, I do try as well, I was talking the last day about you know, white privilege, and then I looked at some of my own work, and I could see where there are new ideas, let's say, about, you know, white privilege or about racism, and you'd be saying to yourself, well, what's all these ideas about? And sometimes, if you critique yourself, you'd find it's helpful. You know, it it's not destructive to be self-critical. I think there's a difference. I used to be self-destructive in the way that I thought about myself. I used to live in a way that I was I was completely possessed by negative voices, saying negative, destructive things about my sense of self. And that wasn't good, and that was at a time where I would needed to go to therapy. That was a time when I would say I was depressed. I think the big transformation for me, the big growth point for me in therapy was actually leaving therapy, was actually finding that there was a deeper journey to say, I rely on a higher power. You know, in this moment, I rely on some presence, some mentor deity to support me. And again, I was asked on the stage, we had questions and answers with the audience, me and Blind Boy. And one question was about meditation and like how, how, how often do I meditate or how long? And I was saying that I hear people talking about meditating and they say, well, oh, I do 40 minutes twice a day or oh, I get up at six o'clock and I meditate for an hour or whatever. Now, Single-pointed meditation where you would be just focusing on one image, one candle, one thought, one one rhythm of breath or mantra. Single-pointed meditation where you're not kind of absorbed in the flow of negative emotion and, and you know, attachments. and Single-pointed meditation like that. I honestly think if you get about 30 seconds of it, you're doing fierce well. Maybe maybe you don't ever get there. Maybe you think you get there. There's always that kind of delusion in meditation 
Are you meditating or are you thinking that you're meditating? And what is meditation? And that's where my teacher, Rinpoche, was very helpful because he said, he'd said that the, the, the word that they use in Tibet is, is like familiarity. And so if I'm using that and transferring it into a Christian idea, it's becoming familiar with a deity, a mentor deity. It's, it's like, for example, I have Tsongkhapa. Tsongkhapa, he's, he's a great monk of the 15th century. He was the man who shaped all the Buddha sutras into the what he called the Lam Rim teachings. And the Lam Rim is a kind of a, you know, stages of the path. It's a kind of a step by step, simple teaching that helps people practice Buddhism at its deepest level. And yet they're simple stages of the path. And that was a great, great sort of thing that Tsongkhapa did in the 15th century. I, I have a, a kind of an image of him. It's a tanka. It, it's one of those, you know, wall hangings with a sort of a, a wooden thing across at the bottom to keep it weighted down. Now that hangs from a cross beam just above my stove. When I when I look at that, the presence of this being is is like f- close to me, and if I do it every day, I, I kind of become familiar. It's like I'm used to his presence in my mind stream. And if I do the same with Saint Anthony or the Mother of Jesus or anybody, it's, it's the same kind of sense of familiarity. It's the same. If you practice familiarity with the deity, with a mentor deity, with a with sense of that otherness, that presence, well, that was the way that Rinpoche taught me to meditate. And it was amazing afterwards, I remember when I'd be reading on, you know, Mark the monk, he'd be a Christian meditator in the deserts of Egypt, third, fourth century. And Mark the monk says, you know, short little prayers are better than long ones. Those five second prayers, those five second, ten second moments where you stop and you kind of pull your whole sense of your body and mindfulness together into one conscious presence and there you experience anotherness. You experience, it's like you're in relationship. It's like you're not alone. It's like you're with another person. Even though there's nobody in the room. And that would be the key to how I developed meditation. Is called just being familiar with. And in that sense, it's also like, you know, I think it's St. Paul says we should pray unceasingly. And and that's it too, because if you're doing it at a level of, you know, a 10-second spot, a 10-second moment, well, that's something that you can do all the time. So that you can access samadhi, you can access mindfulness now now it, it's always now it's it's not it's not at six o'clock this evening or ten o'clock tonight it's not at six o'clock tomorrow morning yes you can you can make those slots and they will strengthen your meditation they will increase your motivation they will make you they'll just transform your life i mean one time famous moment the dalai lama was asked you know, I want to be a Buddhist, what do I do? And he laughed and he said, get up early in the morning. And I also know people, I know one person who would be dear to me, and he gets up very early in the morning, he can't sleep, he gets up at six o'clock in the morning, winter or summer, and he's walking around the beautiful landscape alone at that hour of the morning. Now he doesn't call it meditation necessarily, but he's meditating. 
he's coming into a relationship with the other. The other might be the river, the trees, the person in the bed beside you. You're just you're just wakening in every second. That to me is the best form of meditation. And then you have your formal times where, where you do some kind of, you know, morning or evening or compassionate meditation or whatever, but but essentially your meditation is just being here. And it's not something that you'll do later, it's something that you're doing right now. And you're not going to tell yourself that you're doing it badly or well. You're just going to do it. It's just like, it's like breathing. We are here. And then when you come to the whole way that the world becomes very critical, very negative about everything, you find that it's okay because you're getting a confidence from your own if you like, secret prayer life. I think I would always call it a secret prayer life. I think that prayer is secret. I think that, I think Jesus said that, in fact, you know, go into the little space in your heart and there, in secret, talk to your father. should be a secret thing. Like, like, am I making it public by talking in this podcast about prayer? In a way, maybe I am, and maybe... Maybe I'm only doing that just between you and me. Maybe there's some sense there's some sense whereby the podcast is like a private forum, you know? It's like it's like what I'm saying here is just a secret. It's just between me and you. It's private. Because there's something about talking about prayer publicly or even talking about faith publicly. It it kind of goes dead. It, it, you know, you hear the words coming out of your mouth and the minute they're out, they're dead words. That's sometimes, I think. And so it's, 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 it's more like a, a kind of a secret thing you have of meditation, of finding relationship with the God. Something you do secretly. If you're doing that secretly, if you're, if you're living this kind of, if you like, a secret joyful life so you have this you have this secret you're telling nobody and it is like that that God holds you up that you're longing for God you know the psalm that says more than the watchman for daybreak I long for the Lord my soul is thirsting for the Lord like a dry, weary land without water. Now think of that longing, that longing for the Lord, and then think it's, it's fulfilled, it is satisfied, it is refreshed. Because that's what happens if you just spend a little time in silence, secretly, In random moments of the day, you, it's like it's like any any half hour. There could be flash moments where you recall where you are. You don't say, "Oh, let me remember I'm here in Waterford," or "Let me remember I'm here in Leitrim." No, because that's where you are at a physical level. But if you say something like, "Let me remember," that I am in the presence of God and then leave a few seconds well the curtains around you and the stove and the rafters and the roof and the desk and everything becomes new it becomes in some way infused with a kind of energy a sense of, of being present and the feeling you get is one of being in relationship It only took a second. In, in Islam, they, they do it every five times a day. And basically, that is what Islam is. To actually recognize that presence. To say, 
there is no God but the God. And to stay in that moment, to stay with that presence, to bow down physically before that presence, to, to wash the hands and the feet, and make ablu ablutions, make, make ritual washings, or even of the tongue, and then physically bow down and say those words, there is no God but the God. And then to stay with that. Is what is what happens in Islam. So beautiful. I can do that or you can do that without having to go to a mosque. Although I must say it's really interesting that it's really interesting to me that to become Muslim, to to follow Islam, the path to Allah is simply to go to any place, I think, as far as I know, not necessarily a mosque, and to have one or two witnesses and who are Muslim and in their presence to declare that there is no God but the God and that Muhammad is his prophet. To declare that ritually before a witness or before witnesses is the threshold whereby you step over into that world. And then you begin to see how, how amazingly beautiful and eloquent Islam is, because keep away from all the arguments and ideas about uh, the Taliban and Saudi Arabia and the complexities of Iran and the way that, that men get to control religion and then use religion to control women and the whole thing becomes an appalling misogyny. Just stay away from the complexity of those images and ideas because those things those things feed back in the negativity to Europeans, to Westerners, and then the Westerners start to think, oh, this is all bad stuff out there. But imagine if we could find that in all religion there is the one religion. Imagine if we could find that beauty. And and for me, the first time I went into a mosque, Finsbury Park in, in London, many, many years ago, and took the feet, shoes off, and went into the big space to pray. And I said to the fellow that was showing me around, can I pray here? And he said, only if you're Muslim. And I thought, ah, oh, that's a pity. And I didn't pursue it any further. And it was only years later that I started reading stuff on Islam and I got friendly with somebody who is Muslim and who's really a, an enlightening person about the beauties of Islam and the beauty of Sufi. Because when you're talking Sufi and you're talking Rumi, you're actually talking Muslim. And it was only that, at that later stage where I realized that when your man said to me, oh, you can pray here only if you're Muslim, he wasn't actually excluding me. He was actually saying, yes, if you want to just declare a very simple acknowledgement of God and Muhammad, then do so and, and enter the presence of God in that mosque. And I feel sometimes that day will come again, you know, where... I might step over that threshold. Because you're talking about the one God. You're talking about the one experience of presence that is everywhere and in everything and all around us and is constantly calling us to love and calling us to love with the assurance of love. It's, it's just such a good news story. And the differences between Islam and Christianity seem to me to be minuscule. The differences between all the difference, the different, the various kind of religions within Christianity, the difference is tiny. So you get Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all, all using the same scriptures, all 
starting with the original point of Abraham and the sense of mono, monotheism, that sense that there is one God. And then, and then they all turn into beautiful colours as well. You know, it's like a kaleidoscope of colour, any religion. So that you have the sense of one God, but you also have this lovely sense of angels and the communion of saints. I know all the different icons that you have in, let's say, orthodoxy, they're so beautiful, they're so aesthetically beautiful, but, but they also give you sort of pathways through relationship with different personae. You know, you connect with the Mother of God, somebody else would connect with St. Jude, somebody else would connect with Padre Pio. So there's, there's such a diversity of colour, a kaleidoscope of colour, in the ways that you can access this sense of presence. And I suppose the simplest form of meditation that I find which I can do in the car, I can do walking around, I can do, I could nearly do it on stage, like, it's just to stop for a second and recall that you're in the presence of God. And that's all there is. As Rumi says, wash yourself as the snow washes itself away. That prayer or spirituality, all this stuff of uh, wisdom is is not things to be grasped. You're not trying to, you know, become skilled as somebody who is prayerful or become skilled as somebody who is meditating. You're, you're simply getting obstacles out of the way so that you can recognize actually who you are. And who you are in this present moment. If you do those things, it gives you a sense of positivity. If you, it gives you a sense of courage and hopefulness so that when you're listening to the news, when you're watching stories of terrible, terrible suffering in various places far and wide, but also in your own world, in Ireland. And, and I, I do think we're, it's like at the surface Politically, we're really on the brink of something. And it seems close to despair. If you look at the amount of activists who are, you know, fighting against racism, injustice, misogyny, if you look at the, the amount of that stuff there is ab abroad, it's like, God, we're living in a terrible world. So where's the hope? And sometimes the flow of activism to change the world is a flow that has to direct its, itself against what's wrong. So the energy is to tear down what is wrong in the culture so that we can build something new. Sometimes it's hard to figure out, well, what, what, what will the new thing look like? And it's... it's the answer is like, well, we don't know because we haven't torn down the bad stuff yet. It's like, it's like there's things that are wrong. Politicians, banks, injustice, war. There's so much to be done. And that, it's wonderful we're doing it. It's really good. But it can be overwhelming. It can be that just the energy that you give to the surface level of politics, passively absorbing one story after another on the news, in the talk shows, in the newspapers, from your friends, in your family, and it's like one dark thing after another. And there has to be a relationship between that and mental health. And so, giving somebody hope can be an antidote. Not that the hope you give them is a, is a rational, logical, political formula. 
maybe maybe religion is totally to do with the internal fora the forum of your own heart within maybe that's maybe it's just all inside like a psychotherapy or maybe it has a wider dynamic maybe it's actually true because everything i've said so far about religion is based on the premise that it's it's not necessarily true it could be just that prayer has a placebo effect that it makes you feel better feel good feel positive and i'm saying that even for that reason it's worth doing it's worth practicing prayerfulness contemplation centering prayer i think some people use but for me it's random for me ironically it's what i got from being close to the pension utral utral rimpeche for probably i would say around 10 years where where i would connect with him fairly regularly where i would practice formally methods of meditation where i would accept initiations from him that kind of intensity And the, the two big things I learned in it were, number one, don't grasp. There's no need to grasp wisdom or to grasp love or, you know, to try and be a better person. It's, it's only a question of, like, letting go of the attachments and you realize who you really are in the present moment. And the other great thing I learned, I think, was that phrase, the ultimate teaching is that there is no teaching. Don't don't grip even the language of faith. Don't even grip that as some sort of confident truth that you can hold on to. Maybe it's not true. I always have that underneath everything I say. If I celebrate and sing the glories of God or, you know, Jesus or... Islam or whatever, underneath it is always my open heart accepting the possibility this may not be true, this may be just poetry. And that's why I always say I'm a writer, I'm a storyteller, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm, I'm not a healer or a teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm just a storyteller. Sure, it mightn't be true, I'm just telling you stories. What I do know from experience is that if you use your mentor deity, if you use the sense of a relationship or a presence with the mentor deity, that she or he is with you, present with you, loving you, supporting you, if you do that, it will make you feel good. You will feel better. It has a placebo effect. And that is very valuable for the world we live in where everything is so fraught at the moment, so much tearing apart of each other in so many ways. There seems to be no cohesion at the wider political level, at the cultural level. Now is the time to maintain that calm abiding in your heart and making it your big secret. This is really who I am. I mean, I may be torn between different ideas and different arguments and emotions and people and all sorts of, you know, fraught things in my life at the surface, but... There is a little place inside, a secret room in my heart where I feel good and loved and blessed. Because I go there every half hour of the day or any time during the day, just randomly I'm able to access that space within my body, within my mind stream. I'm able to be there and experience the sense of that I'm in a presence, the presence of God. 
You do that and you're actually being a Buddhist, you're being Muslim and you're being Christian and you're being Jewish. I think you're being Hindu as well. I just don't know as much to be able to say anything about Hindu. But I think every religion is saying the same thing. There is a ground of being. And the dynamic is like a relationship. It's like, as one scientist said, the electrons are not neutral. It's almost like the attachment of love is built into the atoms and the quantum particles. It's a beautiful sense of where the universe is going. Even if, even if humans were not necessarily always at the centre of the narrative, because there was millions of years when we weren't here, maybe there will be millions of years when we're not here, and, and maybe that's okay. You know, there's, there's no need to configure God in our terms. There's no need to measure God by the size of humanity. The opposite is the miracle. The opposite is to think about the transcendence of God and its, its unfathomable mystery manifested in a human, becoming human. So he has visited us. He has visited us. He has transformed us in this moment. It doesn't mean he's on our terms. God's presence. And so I find that when you're positive, when you're positive about yourself, because you're rooted in the sense of paying attention, that's another lovely phrase that fits here. You know, pay attention. Pay attention to what's in the room. Pay attention to the flickering fire or the flame of the candle. Pay attention to the icon. But pay attention also to what is invisible, what you can sense around you as being present to you. And when you do that, it's actually easier to be self-critical. To say, you know, maybe maybe I've made mistakes. Maybe we all have unconscious bias. Maybe maybe we do things that, you know, we're living off various aspects of white privilege or white male privilege that, that we're not aware of. There's an example of it during the week with Tommy Tiernan, who acknowledged that He'd made a joke that had offended somebody that that he wasn't aware that he wasn't he wasn't properly assessing and judging how he was behaving and he was able to say, I can see there there was no conscious bias and he apologized. But the thing is there was a graciousness and a mag- magnanimity about that. He was saying, oh yeah, I can be wrong. I may have been wrong there. I'm sorry. It it doesn't destroy you to be self-critical. It can be liberating. And I was thinking that I'll share a little reflection with you just to finish up. Um, As you know, I love meeting people But I also love to meet people from different cultures, chance encounters that happen in public spaces. Well, I was buying a bottle of water in Cork train station recently when a man behind the till spoke to me in Irish. He was from Pakistan and learned Irish because he loves languages. We chatted a bit and even exchanged email addresses and on the train later I sent him a message. Jas bulu latar majin. Agus lat fein, he replied as my train approached Portlaoise. 
The light of autumn slanted across the rooftops, and the world seemed beautiful. Such intimacies are delicious. On another occasion, I met a Ukrainian woman in a Dublin bookshop, who told me that when she came to Ireland first, she would go to the sea every day and walk up and down the beach for hours, crying. She was holding a copy of my new book, and her simple revelation was like a prayer, a song of grief and sorrow. I felt I was being invited into a sacred space as she spoke. Although life on the road selling a book is not an entire ecstasy, on one occasion in a shopping centre, my books were displayed on a table near the door, and I sat like an unloved Santa Claus for over an hour trying to attract stragglers, when eventually two English ladies close by began a pointed conversation in heavy Lancashire accents. Who is he? I don't know. Well, who does he look like? Nobody I can think of. He must be a celebrity. He might be. Perhaps he's a celebrity over here. I'm always nervous when English people talk about over here. When they say things like, Do they have Carnation Street over here? Or, Do they not have Asda over here? Eventually, they approached me directly. Are you a celebrity? I grinned and said, No, I'm just well known. Well, one of them said, You can't be that well known because you don't have any people queuing for your book. It was true. If you were Katie Price, she continued, this place would be packed. I may have confused her, or I may have just looked confused myself, because she raised her voice. Don't you know who Katie Price is? I confessed I didn't. Her jaw dropped and they both withdrew like I might have had fangs among my back teeth, and they went off down the mall towards the exit, casting withering glances back at me. Sometimes I imagine the people I meet are as precious and marvellous as angels come from elsewhere, souls from other universes that I encounter only once and will never meet again. Like the gentle grey-haired woman I met in Galway recently. I had been in the Clayton Hotel overnight and in the morning decided to wander towards Café Sol on the second floor of the Dunn Stores complex in the hope of a coffee and croissant. As I walked the pavement, a lady of my own age, appeared at my side, and at the traffic lights she crossed in step with me. Clearly both of us were heading towards the same destination. We passed a sculpture of a gigantic pillow beside the pavement and finally reached the main entrance where the escalators were not stepped, but sloped like hills before us. Together we moved forward, as if on a stairway to heaven, and I felt something angelic resonate from behind her grey eyes and silver hair and the way she smiled without speaking. You're early at the shopping, I suggested. I'm going for a coffee, she explained. Me too, I replied, excited now that I had met someone mysterious and elegant to idle my time with. But Dunn's stores were still closed. The shutters were down. We stood perplexed for a moment until a staff member turned the key and the shutter rose to reveal the pinks and whites and soft cottons of the ladies' department. It was 8.30 a.m. The staff smiled. 
We're going to Café Sol, my companion declared, now using the collective we that made the couple out of us, a twosome from our separate lives. But the, the staff said Café Sol doesn't open until 9 a.m. Well, if I was devastated, I managed to hide it, retaining a dignified silence until the escalator returned us to the ground floor where we parted. Well, it was nice to meet you, she said, shifting a wisp of hair from her eyes. And then she moved away from me, carrying with her all the stories of a lifetime that I would never have a chance to hear. I think that sums up the kind of person I am in relation to other people and stories. I love stories, and it's one of the reasons I love meeting people. And I love meeting strangers. I love meeting people in a kind of casual way where there's no no heavy-duty relationship or engagement. It's just a kind of a real passing thing, like in a, a bus station or at a petrol station or, or there in dun stores. And sometimes when you sit down with somebody like that, they will tell you their life story or they will tell you the most important things that are on their heart. And maybe sometimes I do the same. And I really love that kind of engagement. And then when it comes to people, like I was really surprised in Cork Station to meet the man who was speaking Irish. And he was really good at it. It was a lovely moment. He was from Pakistan. Fluent Irish speaker. And when I meet people like that, or when I meet, let's say, somebody from Ukraine, it, it's a real privilege because they're telling you stories that, I don't know, they're just more interesting. It's, it's more precious. I, I think that, like, for me, stories are precious. They're like jewels. So if somebody from far away tells me their story, I feel privileged. I feel they have given me something deep. And, and I understand my own humanity better if I, if I listen to somebody's story. If you listen to somebody's story, you, you become more human. So that's an amazing thing that stories do. You might listen to them in a cafe, or you might sit and read a book, and you're reading a book, a novel, or a non-fiction. You're still reading people's stories. Like, you're not listening to the news. There can be news about people. There can be news that's upsetting and dark and troublesome, and it's all about divisions and fights and wars and, you know, all sorts of stressful things that, that really go on in society and need to be fixed. And rather than get engaged positively in fixing things, sometimes you can get overwhelmed by the negativity of things that are going wrong in society. But stories are different. Stories, stories are narratives like little rivers, and they, sh they, they show you the human heart. Ukrainian woman comes to Ireland and and day after day, she said she used to go down to the beach and just cry, just walk the beach in tears. That's a story. That makes me more human when I hear that story. And that means that sometimes if I, if I see somebody who is, you know, um, a different colored skin or clearly not, Caucasian in the way the Cavan people are Caucasian so they're from somewhere remote or foreign like Pakistan Nigeria or Cork let's say I used to have a fierce temptation and I'd always do it to ask them where are you from and it was this way of 
connecting with people. I mean, in the in the real old days when I was 18, 19 years of age and I was hitching around the country, I'd be getting a lift to Derry and some fella would pick you up at Castle Blaney and he'd be driving you along towards Oma. And you'd say to him, where are you from? And he'd say, I'm from Oma. And you'd say, I know somebody in Oma called John Cargan. Do you know him? And Ireland was, was small enough at that stage to be naive enough that you could actually find people like that. You could actually sort of say, oh, you're from Listowel. Oh, I know a fellow in Listowel. And that would give you something to talk about, give you connection, give you a sense of, sure, we're all the same. But that day is different. That day is gone now. And with the stress and pressure that people are under, so you've got, you've got a lot of different cultures in Ireland, much more so than anything we imagined. And it's not overcrowded. If anything, this country is empty. This country badly needs more people from other countries to come and enrich us. The way that Germans enrich Leitrim. Germans and East Europeans enrich Leitrim. We, we couldn't have the beautiful, wonderful life we have, not just in hospitals, but in places like restaurants and, and hotels and all the various sort of entertainment industries. We couldn't have the, the life we have in places like Leitrim if there wasn't a certain amount of immigration. And that immigration is not in any way over the top. It's, it's less than what we actually need coming in. But but what happens is because there's tension and because at the moment there's there's you know really really unpleasant stuff going on where people are are saying negative things about immigrants and and trying to stir up trouble and be divisive. It's like you don't want to get into that conversation. I don't want to get into that conversation. But th that's what I say that that. If you have an antidote to it, then, then faith is a wonderful antidote. Faith is a, a wonderful, positive secret in your heart. And then you go out and you meet people, and, and there's people from loads of different cultures around you engage with somebody as in a coffee shop or in the service industry in some other way, and you're wanting to say, where are you from? I, I'm dying to say, where are you from? I was in Letterkenny in August and I went in to get my hair cut in a barber shop and there was a woman there and she was cutting my hair. And I says to her, where are you from? And she said, Warsaw. I'm not sure if she said Warsaw or Poland, but I don't know. She said Poland. And then I said, oh, I go to Warsaw a lot. And we were chatting and we had a great chat about, like, it did open up a lot. But, but in general... You can't do that because it's going to feel threatening to the other person. So when you didn't have the kind of racist, anti-immigrant, divisive agitation that is now going on in Ireland as well as other countries in Europe, when you didn't have that, when we were all kind of innocent and you know, you met somebody from Pakistan on a train and you'd kind of nearly throw your arms around them and say, oh my God, where are you from? Tell us all about life in your country. Now it's different. And people like me are always in danger of making a mistake, of, of actually throwing that question out in a curious and nosy, interrogative way that the other person feels threatened. They don't feel threatened, they feel uncomfortable, right? You don't want... It'd be like if you went into your local shop and somebody said, who are you? Like, what are you doing here? You'd feel, like, very uncomfortable. And I think that's where this affects people who are immigrants in the country. 
it's it's at a time where there's stress and because there are so many difficulties in the numbers coming from let's say ukraine and the ability of ireland to provide the houses there's a danger in the next couple of weeks weeks or months of all sorts of arguments and ugliness and unpleasantness and this is where somebody like me can make the mistake of being curious in a way that actually sounds to the other person aggressive. You know, where are you from? Where are you from? So it really saddens me that I can't say that anymore. I wouldn't, and I really wouldn't say that in future. I meet somebody, they're in the shop, and I think their accent is Polish, maybe it's Lithuanian, and I'm dying to say, you know, where are you from? But I don't. I say, do me business, and thank you very much, and that's it. And we lose something. We lose a sense of intimacy and friendship. But it's necessary because we avoid me asking curious questions that causes the other person to become uncomfortable in a way that they shouldn't be. If I go into any shop, nobody's going to stare at me and say, where are you from? It's like I'm, I'm from here. And so the danger is that in the climate we live in, I say something kind of innocently, lovingly curious about somebody else's life and I want to hear their story and I say, where are you from? And what they're hearing is a kind of a slightly threatening innuendo, like, you're not from here, so where are you from? And I think that it's fair enough to be aware of that. And I check myself, I watch myself, uh, and there's loads of other little questions and ways that you might behave because the person who's the waiter in the restaurant happens to be from, you know, the Middle East or Eastern Europe or wherever. There's to loads of ways that you you kind of deal with them as different and different in not, not an entirely flattering way. Do you know what I mean? So I'm going to try and go through some of those. I did one about white privilege last week and I just thought I'd mention that one, which would be to do with racism and to do with how I would say to myself, well, I need to be more careful never to be putting a person in an uncomfortable situation by asking unpleasant or like kind of nosy questions. And you know, that's about it. That's about it for today. I've gone... I've gone a little bit over the time, but you deserve you deserve a long podcast because I let you down last Friday. Uh, I wasn't here. I was in the hospital and then I had to do the Blind Boy podcast. I hope you listen to Blind Boy. I hope you continue to listen to me. Spread the word and tell anybody you know who wants to listen to me. Come and join us. Keep something secret in your heart. Check yourself every so often during the day that you're in the presence of God and you'll become familiar with it. You'll become familiar with the fact that you are. And you can be kind of a secret Muslim or a secret Christian or a secret Jew secret Buddhist because inside in the little room of your own heart you are constantly becoming more and more familiar with the fact that we are present in the presence of God and you will find that is an antidote day by day it is an antidote to the darkness and the fraction that comes from political discourse at the moment
And that's about it. Thank you for being here. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.